Hebrews 10, 5. But let's pray. O Lord God of heaven, we come to you now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, looking to you this day for our spiritual needs, looking to you this day to be fed from your word. And I pray, Lord, that as we open up your word this time now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would open our ears and our hearts to hear your word, to follow your word, and to believe your word. Pray, Lord, that we would remember what you have done for us, how you gave your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to pay for our sins, that he lay dead in the tomb and that he arose victorious from the grave on the third day. Lord, we thank you for the blessed hope that is found only in him. And I pray, God, that you would guide us and direct us and that we would be willing and obedient to you, following you because we love you, not because we have to. And God, I thank you for your word. It is your word that truly does change people. And I pray, God, that we would be guided, directed, convicted, whatever it is that each of us need this day. And this I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So Hebrews chapter 10, go down to verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, an offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, as we have read in Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel told Mary, and the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Jesus Christ, God himself, whose hand poured out the waters of the earth in the hollow of his hand, whose hand span is the size of the universe, was placed as the holy thing inside Mary's womb. An amazing thing is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And this was the way that Jesus Christ had to come into this world in order to seek and to save that which was lost. A perfect sacrifice was necessary to meet God's judgment for sin. And the only way that there could be a perfect Spotless sacrifice was if God himself provided the sacrifice. Looking back to the first gospel verse of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3, we read God declaring to the serpent in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And it is interesting to note that the gospel message was given to the devil right after the first sin. Adam and Eve would likely have heard what God stated to the devil and we can be thankful that God told Adam and Eve the way of salvation just after they had sinned. As we have seen before, the Lord God speaks of her seed, but a woman does not carry the seed, the man does. What this shows us is that the coming promised one would have a unique birth, a birth that did not involve an earthly father,
but does involve an earthly mother. That is what we know happened with the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. And that phrase right in the middle there of verses 5 and 6, A body hast thou prepared me. That would be what Jesus Christ came to earth in as the holy thing. Jesus Christ still has that body. It is in its glorified state, just as Peter, John, and James had seen when Jesus Christ had been transfigured before them. Jesus Christ is still in that body today, but with five notable differences from that day when he stood glorified on the mount. What are the five differences that Jesus Christ now has? The wounds from the cross, two in his wrists, two in his feet, and the spear hole in his side. The wounds that Jesus Christ showed Thomas after Jesus Christ's resurrection. A body was prepared for Jesus Christ as the holy thing placed into Mary's womb. A perfect, spotless body that was sacrificed for us on the cross. Jesus Christ never committed a sin and the body was provided so that Jesus Christ would be able to do the will of God during his entire time here on earth. The Lamb of God was the perfect sacrifice offered up by the high priest, Jesus Christ, to provide the cleansing of sins for those that believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ and have repented of their sins. God does not want our offerings and sacrifices if they are not performed in obedience to him. And that was the problem for the Jews continually. They were willing and able to regularly perform the sacrifices prescribed by God for sacrifices for sin, but they were not done with the correct motivation behind them. Jesus Christ always obeyed the will of God. The Jews, unfortunately, would go through the motions of the sacrifices, but there was no heart behind them. There was no proper motivation behind them. They thought if they could just do the action, that was enough. But it's not the action that God is interested in. It is the heart. It is the motivation, the love for him that he is interested in. Now, Jesus Christ always did the will of God. And as he said in John chapter 17, he said to God, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Only doing the burnt offerings and sacrifices was not enough for God. It is not as if he needed the burnt bullocks or lambs. No, instead what God wants is our obedience, our willing obedience. He does not want sacrifices that are done begrudgingly. He does not want offerings that are done to simply cross another item off the checklist or only because God said to do them. Keep your finger in Hebrews. We'll go over to first, Second Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter nine. Second Corinthians nine, verse seven. And Paul wrote, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. We're to give, as he says there, according as we purpose in our heart, so let us give. In other words, it's not so much a focus on a percentage or anything, but we're to give as the Lord leads us to give. Sometimes it may be more, sometimes it may be less. But the point being is that when it is the more, to do the more. You know, And, and the point is, is that we're to do it not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. We don't give in order to get. Because then it's not a give. It's a contract again. You know, God gave us 
the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. He wants our obedience back. He doesn't want and say, oh, you need to now do this, 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 and don't do that, 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 that. He wants our willing obedience. He's not saying, okay, you need to do these sacrifices and it's all good. We can do those sacrifices, but if the heart's not right behind them, they're just meaningless, vain actions. They have no point to them then. God love, uh, loves a cheerful giver. God wants our sacrifices and offerings done with the proper motivation. And what is the proper motivation? Love and thanksgiving. We offer up to God our best, not our least, because we love God and are thankful to him. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Why should we be thankful to him? Because he has given us his best, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ willingly went to the cross for us to pay the sin debt that none of us could ever hope to pay. He was willing to give up his life for me, even though I am a lowly worm and unworthy of salvation. Jesus Christ was still willing to be born in the most humble of fashions, grow up in a poor area of Israel, never owning a home, walking everywhere he went, only own, owning only the clothes on his back, willing to die on a cross made from a tree of his own creation, nailed to the cross by his own creation, laid dead in a tomb hewn from a hill of his own creation, and then Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead on the third day. That alone should cause us to be exceedingly grateful and love him because he was willing to do this. Are you walking in obedience to him as according to his word? You think about all that he has done for us, all that he has given. We could spend all day just counting our many blessings. You know, that breath you just took, he gave us that. He gave us the oxygen to, oxygen to be able to breathe that. Each of you walked in here this day. That was a blessing from God. It may have been a little slower. It may have needed some help. But even that was a blessing from God. You know, you were all able to drive here this day. Some of us walked across, but, you know, the point being, we were all able to be here. That was a blessing from God. We have clothes on our back. Most of us ate breakfast this morning, I imagine. And if not, then we'll certainly have lunch or dinner later on. That's a blessing from God. You know, we, we can... <laughs> We would never run out of blessings when we really think about it. Because even just the littlest things, you think about it, it's a blessing that I own a fingernail clipper. Now, they can sound funny, but think about it. My nails are nice and smooth. I didn't have to use my teeth to chew them off. I didn't have to get out my Swiss Army knife and trim my nails. God blessed me with a fingernail clipper. So even just things that we don't even think about or take for granted, you know, we have those things. He has blessed us in so many ways. How can we not be thankful to him and praise him for what he has done for us? Go back over to Hebrews chapter 10. We're done in Corinthians. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Hebrews 10, 7. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Now Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, is quoting from Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. So keep your finger here in Hebrews, but go back over, hopefully you kept your bookmark. Psalm 40. Psalm 40. Verse 6. Psalm 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. 
I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40 is known as being a messianic psalm. In other words, it's a psalm about Jesus Christ that was written by David under Holy Spirit inspiration. Now, the sacrifices that God required in the Old Testament were only coverings for sin. The sacrifices also pointed toward a better sacrifice that was to come, a final completed sacrifice that was found only in Jesus Christ. The blood of bulls and goats were not enough to take away sins. They only provided a covering and had to be repeated as a person sinned. Jesus Christ is that final sacrifice that purged us from our sins and saved us from the wrath and condemnation of God. And again, as we talked about earlier with all of that, you think about that, if we really try to take stock of how many sins we commit in a day, you know, even if they're just sins in our head, they're still sins. But even you know, the words that end up coming out of our mouths or whatever, if we took stock of those sins, in the Old Testament, they were supposed to sacrifice the animals for those sins. You know, they were supposed to bring a, a sheep or a, even a, a, a turtle dove or a pigeon, whatever. They were to bring those things for the sin offerings to God. We'd have to be at the tabernacle or at the temple all day long. That's right. You know, we, we, we wouldn't, we'd be so busy there, we wouldn't have time to sin. And yet we probably would because we'd still be grumbling about the line to the altar or any number of things like that. You know, we, we, we lose sight of how horrible our sin really is. We lose sight of how God views our sin. And that's why we needed that one final sacrifice with Jesus Christ there. Now, in Psalm 40, there's an interesting phrase that's in here that Paul didn't repeat, or whoever it was that wrote the book of Hebrews didn't repeat. Um, and then again, it points to the necessity that Jesus Christ had to be incarnated here on earth. Jesus Christ could not come here on earth as a spirit that would not be a proper sacrifice to God. Jesus Christ could not have been born a non-supernatural birth because then he would not be a spotless sacrifice. But there are those that believe that Jesus Christ was born a man in the normal fashion, but became deity at some point. And some even believe that he was when he was baptized by John the Baptist, that's when he became deity. Jesus Christ had to be incarnated here and placed as the holy thing in Mary's womb. Now, Psalm 40 has that phrase, Mine ears hast thou opened. It's in verse 6 there. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Keep your finger here in Psalm 40. Go to Exodus 21. Exodus chapter 21. Second book of the Bible. In Exodus chapter 21, it's a fascinating passage about um, a man that has been sold into slavery and servanthood. Exodus chapter 21, verse 2. Okay. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years shall he serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him unto the judges." He shall also bring him to the door or unto the door post, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. If a Hebrew man was bought, 
He could only serve six years and then he was supposed to be made free in the seventh. Why? Because that would be the, the Sabbath year, if you will. It was just like the Sabbath year. And if there was a Jubilee year involved in there every 50 years, then the person could end up being released even sooner. The point was is that God had instituted this as a help. This is not slavery as slavery was done down in the South back in the 1800s or anything like that. The idea was that the Jew was to take care of his fellow Jew and he was to care for them and provide for them and help them. And so if a man had to go into to slavery or into servanthood, it was often because he often owed a debt that he could not pay. And the master was only to keep him for six years, then release him. You know, and so even if in the master's eyes, well, he hadn't paid off the debt, God says, if he's been there six, you release him in the seventh. You know, and you were to forgive the debt. You weren't to then put him back into bondage again. You were to forgive the debt. The, if he was an unmarried man when he started, then he would leave with nothing. If he had a wife when he began, then he could leave with the wife. If the master gave him a wife, and they ended up having children during the servanthood, then the wife and children had to remain behind with the master if the man left. If the servant chooses to stay because he loves his master and his wife and children, then he submits to an intriguing ceremony. He would be brought to a door or a doorpost and an awl. You all know what an awl is. You know, an awl would be used to pierce the man's earlobe. And so if you saw a man walking around with a hole, a big hole, put pierced into his earlobe, then you knew that he had chosen to remain with his master and had been given a wife. So what does all of this mean for us? Now in Psalm 40, it says, Mine ears hast thou opened. And that word opened means to dig or bore, B-O-R-E, bore. In other words, it points to the practice we just read about more so than it does about just open my ears so I can hear you better. Because the point is, is that it's pointing towards really the earlobe. It's pointing towards what we just read about in Exodus 21. Now Psalm 40 is quoted in Hebrews 10, which is all about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was incarnated here on earth, lived and walked among us, and when he turned 30 years old, Jesus Christ began his ministry. His earthly ministry lasted for about three years. Now in John chapter 8, while being hardly, harshly questioned by the Jews, Jesus Christ asked, Which of you convinceth me of sin? Meaning, can one of you tell me what sin I have committed? Jesus Christ several times clearly told and showed them that he is the Son of God and God himself, but they did not want to believe. Even during his trial before, being, before being taken to Pilate, the Jews had to search hard to find two men that were willing to order in order to have an accusation against him. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ never, ever sinned and was the spotless, sinless Lamb of God. Jesus Christ was always obedient to God, who had given him a wife, the church. Jesus Christ loves each of us and willingly gave himself for us. In John chapter 17, he said, And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus Christ loves us. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ was pierced for us. Not his earlobe, but he was given a body to be pierced for us, and that body was pierced for us on the cross. Psalm 22.6 tells us, They pierced my hands and my feet. 
Zechariah 12.10 says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. John 19 verse 37 quotes Zechariah. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him who they pierced. Revelation 1 7 tells us, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Go back now to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus Christ was given a body to be sacrificed for each of us. Remember back in Exodus, that servant had, that had been given a wife could choose to remain in slavery with her if he loved her. Jesus Christ has a bride ready for him, the church. Keep your finger in Hebrews. Go over to Ephesians. Chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. Ephesians 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the husbands be to their own husbands, I'm sorry, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Jesus Christ was willing to be pierced for his church because he loves the church, the body of believers. He had to be placed in the womb of Mary as the holy thing in order to be born as was prophesied in the Old Testament. No other way was, was sufficient. The incarnation of Jesus Christ is something we must remember along with his death, burial, and resurrection. This is something to remember any time of the year, not just in December. His birth is unique just as his gospel is unique. Daily we must look unto Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. And this is not just a Sunday and Wednesday thing. This is not just a December thing. And then again in March or April, we are to look unto Jesus Christ every day. Why? Because he has done this for us. How much more should we be doing for him then? Go back over to Hebrews but Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, who's this cloud of witnesses? What we would have just read about in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, if you will. That would be the cloud of witnesses, all those men and women throughout the years that had faith in Jesus Christ and what they did and while they followed Jesus Christ and followed God. That's that cloud of witnesses. So let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So we're to take and lay aside every weight and put away that sin which so does easily beset us. In other words, that sin that we just keep seeming to go back to, we're to lay it aside, we're to cast it away. It's supposed to be left behind 
not re- brought back up when we need something or we we we're despondent about something or or we just don't care that day or whatever we're to leave those things behind those are just weights on us they pull us down they drag us away he uses the race analogy here and let us run with patience the race that is set before us we have a race that is before us each and every day we're to run it with patience now that seems kind of odd because you know when you watch a a a track beat on tv or or anything like that they don't seem to be waiting with patience no they're trying to get to that finish line as quickly as they can that's not our goal to get to the finish line as quickly as we can god will take care of that part we just keep going until the finish line is there because we don't know when the finish line will be finish line may actually be as far as i am to the carpet here for me or the finish line could be a long ways off yet we don't know for sure we're never sure what that date will be but in the meantime we run with patience with that verse 2 looking unto jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of god this is the only time in the bible that the word looking uses this particular greek word this looking means to consider attentively not just a quick glance but to gaze toward Jesus Christ and consider what great works he has done keeping Jesus Christ in our eyesight and remaining focused on him and this requires us to remember all aspects of his life and what he has done for each of us this remembering should draw us ever closer to him in love and obedience we have his word to read and to reread and it should bring us closer to him when you when you see a track meet happen and you see them running you know the 50 yard dash or whatever and they're running along are they watching looking in the crowds are they looking at their coach as they're running that 50 yard dash no their focus is on that finish line that's ahead of them why because you know what would happen i know what would happen for me if i took my eyes off that finish line i'd probably end up running into the crowd or running into one of the other track people or whatever we keep our eyes focused on that finish line and that's what that verse is saying that word looking is more than just looking here looking here over there we're to gaze intently upon it we're to be staring that's where our focus will be is upon jesus christ not all around us remember when paul sorry not paul but remember when peter got out of the boat to walk on the water to jesus christ he was doing fine as long as he was looking at jesus christ but what happened he looked around him and he saw the waves were boisterous and that's when he began to sink and that's the same thing that happens with us when we take our eyes off of jesus christ we begin to sink we begin to turn away from him we begin to drift into other directions jc ryle warned beware if you love life beware of a christless religion a watch without a mainspring a steam engine without a fire a solar system without the sun all these are but faint and fable images of the utter uselessness of a religion without christ and next to a christless religion beware of a religion in which christ is not the first foremost chief principal object the very alpha in the alphabet of your faith he who enters upon a series of arithmetical arith, arithmetical calculations requiring weeks and months of brain exhausting toil he knows well that his labor will all be in vain and his conclusions faulty if a single figure is wrong in his first line in other words he's picturing there you know you think about when you see you know a, a chalkboard and it's got 
equations written all over it as they're trying to figure something out. And so he got lines and lines of math equations. But if he has something wrong in this first equation, everything else is going to be wrong. That's why we've got to start out right at the beginning. Otherwise, we're not going to end up right in the end. If a single figure is wrong in his first line, then all of his labor will be in vain. And he who does not give Christ his rightful place and office in the beginning of his religion must not be surprised if he never knows anything of joy and peace in believing and goes cheerless and comfortless on his way to heaven with all the voyage of life found in shallows and in misery. We have to keep ourselves focused towards Jesus Christ. And as he says there in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And that's where we keep our eyes focused towards. We can have all kinds of things going on around us. We can have all kinds of distractions. We can have parties and celebrations and, and, and presents and, and traveling and everything else. All those things can happen, but our focus still has to be towards Christ. It's still looking towards him, not these other things. These other things are fine, but we have to keep the focus towards Christ. Not the focus on the things, but on Christ. That should be our focus. And it's not just every, it's just not today, not tomorrow, but it's the each and every day our focus remains on Jesus Christ. Because again, we're running, if you will, a 50-yard dash, each of us. Well, let's make it a 100-yard dash. Let's go with that. A 100-yard dash. Why? Because we'll call each yard a year of life here on earth. So we may all live to be 100. It could happen. But in that time, as you're running that 100-yard dash, if you're off a little bit when you're 20, you think about that. You know, When you're running in a dash, you've got the two lines and you're staying within that narrow path. You're staying within that. But if you're off when you're 20, we'll say, what happens? 20, you're still kind of in the path. 30, you moved off the path. 60, you're... You're way off the path. Why? Because that's the direction we're pointing towards. But if we keep our eyes forward towards Christ, we're going to stay straight on that path. Now, the finish line will probably come a lot closer than 100 yards for each of us, but it may not. We don't know when that will be. And he doesn't say, stop. He says, keep going, looking ahead to him. That's where our hope is. And that's where other people's hope can be found, is in Jesus Christ. That's why we need to let them know. Because they're walking around and they're trying to, they're going to be opening up presents tonight. They're going to be opening up presents tomorrow. And, and then five minutes after they're done, the kids are going to be, what's next? Where's the other one? You know. And within a week, half of those presents won't even get touched ever again, or they got broken. You know? You know, we need to keep our focus towards Christ in all of these things. Remembering what he has done. Why? Because he is the author and finisher of our faith. He's not the only the one that, that figured it out, if you will, as the author. It's not, you know, it's because of his plan that, that we have that. But he is also the finisher of it. He began it and he saw it to the end. So that each of us can have that faith in Jesus Christ. And we can let others know that they can have that faith in Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. They would just repent of their sins and believe on him. They can have that peace and joy that can only come from him and nothing else. And let's pray. <clears throat> our God and our Father. Lord, we thank you yet again for your word. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have shown us in your word. And we thank you, Lord, that we can know that your word is true, every last bit of it. And I pray, Lord, that we would daily keep our eyes towards Jesus, looking towards him 
and not being distracted by other things, remembering what he has done for us, and knowing that what he has done for us in the past means he will keep his promises for the future. And Lord, we so look forward to that day of being with him in heaven. And Lord, I pray that each of us would run with patience, run and follow Jesus Christ to the very end. I thank you, Lord, that you equip us to do that. And I pray that we would be vessels fit for your use each and every day. And this I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.